Okay, yeah. Okay, sorry. So anyway, so thanks a lot for the invitation to this great meeting. I'm really happy to be here and meet so many of you, which I couldn't do for the last two years. <laughs> um, okay, so this uh, is work about uh, that it has been ongoing for many years now, and I will give you a summary of uh, of old results, which are the form of basis, and then also some new results and um, well, some open questions still have to be tackled. The outline you can see here. I will first talk about the models that I'm considering, even though this is just uh, really uh, very specific models. Um, uh, then I will give you something more general uh, about nonlinear fractality and hydrodynamics. And then I will come in the third section to our actual results, uh, third and fourth section. And then in the end, as I say, I will summarize again and um, be ready for questions. Okay, so, um, okay, let me see. Nope, no, this doesn't work for some reason. Okay, right. Now, so first of all, um, why do I talk about one-dimensional systems with short-range interactions? Well, we all know that they have unusual properties, both statically and dynamically. So for instance, static properties, um, they are different from what mean field theory would predict in higher dimensions. So you get anonymous transport in non-equilibrium steady states. You even get can get phase separation, even though you have small short-range interactions, which will not normally happen in equilibrium in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in one dimension. But then there are also dynamical phenomena, which are a bit unusual. So for instance, you get not only diffusion if you have some kind of random process, but particularly you get super diffusive spatial thermal scaling. Uh, we know this for a long time from the KPC equation and then some other seminal work in this direction is also very old by Deepak Da and uh, Herbert and uh, student Gua. Now, um, what one finds is that the dynamical universality class with the dynamic exponent less than two, meaning super diffusive, and the scaling function will not be Gaussian as in normal diffusion, but something non-Gaussian. So this is the topic I want to talk about. Now, first of all, I will talk about specific type of models, even though I will also say and argue that it's more general what I'm going to discuss. Um, I mean, this kind of problems have been indeed have been addressed in many different class of systems like anharmonic chains, for instance, but also in lattice gas models, and that's what I want to focus on. So I have a lattice with particles jumping randomly on it, and I have will assume that in general have uh, several conservation laws like conserv conservation of, of a type of particle. Um, so you can imagine different types of molecules or uh, Partings of different size piles that, can, that you can somehow distinguish, but all of, of all of which will have very many of each species. Now, if you have this kind of situation then in a stationary state, in a non equilibrium steady state, you will have m different stationary currents that arise from these conservation laws, and these will be functions of these of these conserved densities. And what I want to study, what is the goal of this of this work, is to look at universality classes for the dynamic structure functions of these uh, of these conserved quantities. So the dynamic structure function, these are the stationary correlation of the fluctuation fields. So you look at your conservation law, you, you subtract the stationary mean, and you look at the fluctuations of this quantity. So it's this object here that I'm interested in. Alpha will be the index for my conservation law that I have. Um, now, from this quantity, you can immediately arrive some some static quantities. For instance, if you take the sum of all lattice sites, then you will get the static compressibility matrix. Look at the derivative and take this sum here. You will get the current Jacobian, which is also independent of time. Now, if you don't take this sum, but you really look at large K and T, then we expect some uh, uh, scaling with the dynamic exponent and scaling functions, which we want to understand. So that's the general picture. So specifically, as I say, I want to talk about lattice gas models and to, uh, well, most of you will know, but nevertheless, let me uh, introduce first the most simple one, which is the asymmetric simple exclusion process, which has only one conservation loss. You can see from this reference that it has been studied really for a long time. Now, what is this process like? Well, we have a lattice, okay, of let me take L sites with periodic boundary conditions for simplicity. And um, it's an exclusion process, which means that each lattice site is either empty or occupied by a particle. So a configuration of your lattice gas will be specified by this number, by these occupation numbers, which can be zero or one. And the process is very simple. It's a Markovian process. So piles jump to the right and to the left with different rates, which here I call G10 and G01. And exclusion means that you cannot jump from here to here, for instance, or not from there to there. So that's what this process is like. Now, um, here's just the generator. 
And uh, if you act with a generator, it's just a mathematical formulation of the process and act on the gen with the generator on your occupation number, then it will be uh, what will come out is this difference of instantaneous currents, which are simply given by this object here. So it's the rate of jumping to the right times the number of particles on side L, which is zero one, times number of vacancies on the target side, minus the reversed process. So this is, and then if you take the expectation of this quantity, then you get the stationary current. Now, how do you take the expectation? Well, let me first fix the total party number, which is conserved, right? So then it turns out that in the steady state, all, part, all configurations are equally likely. That's a computational result, which also means that you do not fix the density, but take a grand canonical example. You will have Bernoulli product measures with a certain density between rho and one. And this gives you this stationary current, which is just F, which is the difference times rho times one minus rho. So you can compute the static uh, compressibility, which again is just rho times one minus rho. So the static properties are extremely simple for this model. Now, just again, a reminder for most of you, I believe, what does this model have to do with interface growth and with KPZ uh, uh, problems? Well, you can map your occupation number to a slope. So you call a slope SL, uh, you define it as one minus two times NL on the dual lattice, meaning on the, on the bonds of the lattice. And then what you see by doing this mapping is that the particle jumps, they map into an interface growth. So if a particle jumps to the right, you change your configuration in such a way that you actually take a, 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 add a particle. Um, I think this is bad drawing. Yeah, in this case, it's the jump to the left that makes a, an upward jump. It doesn't matter. It depends on how exactly you define the problem. The point is that any jump here will correspond to a change of the interface from this to that or the other way around from a local valley, you create a local hill. And then, um, but if you do this mapping, um, you see you define the occupation number by a slope. Um, so there's not a one to one mapping. If something is equal to a slope, you have to add one more quantity to get a one to one mapping, namely, which is the time integrated particle current. So if you count the number of particles that have jumped across a specific bond, then you will see this is the actual absolute interface height at this point. So in this way, you can make a one-to-one -one mapping between these two processes. So you see this particle problem is equivalent to an interface problem, and this will generalize to other pictures. This is just to illustrate this uh, in this, it's most easy to illustrate in this particular example, but it works for models as well. Okay, so now what do you want to know about this problem? Well, it's a random process. So we are certainly not interested in how, what a particular inf configuration will look like. It's simply random. But so what you want to look is at large scale behavior. Uh, how will this look at large scales? What can you say about it? So we want to get something predictable, deterministic out of it. Well, one way of looking at this is to take uh, to coarse grain space and um, rescale uh, space and time. Um, so you take um, uh, X to be a lattice spacing times the, the lattice side and time you also rescale. So you look at it just from a big distance with this scaling here. Now, then uh, you use particle conservation, the law of large numbers. So you look at the number of piles in a, in a big microscopic segment, which will be a small microscopic one. And he also used that locally you expect this to be stationary because of the conservation law. And then one can prove actually prove rigorously that the dynamics of the density in this, in this little box is given by, uh, well, this is just a conservation law. And if you plug in the stationary current as a function of density, you will realize that this is just a inviscid Burgers equation. So, and then, of course, we know that this is to the KPC equation, namely if you define the local density on the macroscopic scale to be the gradient, again, on macroscopic uh, uh, scale of, of a height, then this here simply turns into the Carter uh, Zhang equation without diffusion term. Okay, this assumes that the driving force is non-zero. If you have a zero driving force or a very weak driving force, then you uh, get a, you have to do a different scaling. Again, you take lattice spacing to zero, but you scale times in a different way, namely you take diffusive scaling, and then you will get the diffusion equation, or more generally the KPZ equation with the diffusion term in the case of weak asymmetry. Okay, so this would be just a deterministic macroscopic behavior where fluctuations are averaged out. But of course, there are fluctuations. So what do these fluctuations look like on macroscopic scale? Well, this can be captured by looking at the dynamic structure function. So let me look at the Fourier transform at this point still on lattice scale. Now I do my scaling. Now what happens? If I have no bias, if I have symmetric hopping, 
where we do diffusive scaling, then you can show that this dynamic structure function is just uh, essentially up to a trivial prefactor equal to this quantity here. So that means we simply have a diffusive propagator with a diffusion coefficient that you can compute explicitly. So this process with zero driving will be in the diffusive universality class with a dynamic exponent two, which is this exponent that appears here, and um, the Gaussian propagator. Now, if you do have a bias, a non-zero bias, then a new result comes out. Uh, first of all, it will not be diffusive, but your fluctuations will scale with an exponent three over two. So you have to do a scaling with a, a three over two uh, ratio to the, to the space scaling. And your uh, function that appears here on large scales is again a universal function, but not the Gaussian, but a function that was discovered by Prehofer and uh, Spohn in 2004 which you can also um, well write down in some more or less explicit form, not quite explicit, but you can evaluate it. So this here is the KPC universality class with dynamics for a three over two and this scaling function. So this is well known um, for almost 20 years. Um, what happens if you have not one conservation loss, but many conservation loss? That's the question here. So now how do you look at many conservation laws. Well, there are obviously very many different ways of doing it. The way I want to do this is as follows. I take not only one exclusion process, not only one lattice, but, but I take parallel lattices. So I take parallel exclusion processes. And so parallels stay in their own lane, they jump there, but the rate of jump will depend not only on the neighboring particles of the same lane, but also on the neighboring particles of the neighboring lane, right? So this is nearest neighbor action between lanes that are introduced, but keeping conservation laws. So I will have as many con conserva conservation laws as I have lanes, right? So here, just to illustration, a totally asymmetric case with hopping only to the right on two lanes. Um, and what I want to look at is this, mo this model here. So my jump to the right will have a constant here, uh, assuming that the target side is empty, um, plus, another constant times the number of neighboring particles of the target sites uh, of the of the original of the original site and the target site on the neighboring lattice right so this is the rate to jump from site k it will be this constant b1 and then be proportional to the number of piles on these two sites here where the jump event occurs um, and then for this particle here it will be the same story a different constant the same direction parameter and then proportional to the number of lanes on, 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 on this, on the other lane, right? So this is the type of model that I want to look at. Specific choice of models, which turns out to be relatively easy to treat because there's also an old result about this type of model. Namely, when you have this kind of dynamics, then your steady state will still be uniform if you fix particle number or a product of Bernoulli measures if you take grand canoling ensembles. This means that you can very easily uh, compute all stationary proper, uh, properties that you want. So in particularly, the two conserved currents are very similar to what we get in the, in the ASAP. There's this factor rho times one minus rho times the constant, which is the bias. And then here is just another contribution that comes from the interaction with the other lane and similar for the J2. So I want to stress that these are exact results. These are not mean field approximations or some other, any other person. This is really what the actual current is. So, okay, you can generalize this as A2M lanes, you can take other interaction within the lanes, you can take partial no exclusion. You will always be able to construct models um, where you get an invariant measure, which is uh, of a simple kind product or something other simple where you can compute these quantities explicitly. So you have a playground for all kinds of current density relations that you can imagine, not arbitrary, but uh, you can really play a lot. Okay, so um, now, this is, these are models on microscopic scale. Now, what can we say about them on macroscopic scale? Well, first of all, we can do again, the same scaling that I explained for the ASAP, this Eulerian scaling. And then what comes out is not just a single conservation law, but a system of conservation laws. You use the same ideas. And what you get is this kind of object. So rho is not just not just a single conserved quantity. I just put all of them into a vector. Then you will find that this is this uh, current Jacobian, uh, which you can compute from the stationary currents times the derivative. So this is just a generalized hyperbolic conservation law. Okay, so this then you can try to solve numerically or whatever you want, um, but this is the deterministic behavior on Eulerian scale. How about the fluctuations? Well, again, 
we uh, expand around the stationary solution. So clearly this has a stationary solution, which are just constants. You see any constant here will satisfy this equation. So we write this as the Sterry solution plus this fluctuation field. And then we look at uh, how these fluctuation fields correlate. Um, so first of all, this will be a complicated object because this uh, fluctuation will, will be nonlinear functions of your local densities. And uh, to look at correlations of nonlinear functions is not an easy task. So let's go step by step. First of all, let's just make an expansion of your density in, in first, uh, of your, of your, uh, of your uh, fluctuation field in first order in the density. Sorry, there's a type that should be rho alpha. Okay, so then I just get this equation, but this is not a function of the densities, in but just a constant, um, which is the current Jacobian at these fixed densities. Well, this of course is a trivial equation, um, just a linear uh, equation. So what do we do with such equation? Well, we transform to normal modes. So you di diagonalize um, your, your Jacobian. Um, and then, uh, okay, you normalize to get really a no, uh, kind of norm, norm, normality condition on your modes. And then these normal modes, they will satisfy this trivial equation, right? So they will decouple because you diagonalized. And then you see that solution is simply traveling waves with, uh, so you fix in your initial data, this will be just moved with the speed V alpha. So V alpha is just the velocity of the fluctuation field in, in this linear order. Okay, so that's the first thing that you do. Then you want to do, study the effect of the nonlinearity. Well, to this end, and this is stuff I learned from Herbert, um, you take, you expand to second order and you add uh, diffusion and noise, which are linked by fluctuation dissipation theorem, but it's not the point here. And then what you end up with by going to the normal modes are coupled noisy Berger equations. So this just, as I say, an expansion of second order in the, in the fluctuation fields. And then this is what your system equations will look like. Here you recognize the linear part I have just shown you. Here is a quadratic part with the so-called mode coupling matrices, which are given uh, in terms of the current density relations through this Hessian. Here's your diffusion and here's your noise. So if you can somehow manage to solve this kind of equation or say something about it, you will get the fluctuation of the coarse grain fluctuation fields. And again, you can make the substitution here and then you will see that this is a system of coupled one-dimensional KBC equations. Okay, now to treat this, one needs another ingredient, which I also learned from Herbert, namely you can do mode coupling theory uh, for the for this dynamic structure function. Of course, you cannot solve this explicitly, except in this very uh, specific case of KPC, where we now have mathematically rigorous results, but generally you do not know how to, how to solve this equation with the noise. So let's look at, um, first of all, a strictly hyperbolic case, which means that your velocities are all different, right? Your mode velocities. If your mode velocities are all different, that means that the modes will, after some time, will separate from each other by a finite, by distance proportional to t. That means that they kind of decouple. So, of course, that means that the off diagonal elements, they will decay quickly, and also products of this type will, will decay quickly. And then what you end up is uh, with a mode coupling equation for just the di diagonal uh, dynamic structure functions in these normal modes, which reads like this. So here you have your diffusive part, which includes the linear and the diffusive term. So this is just a linear object. And then here you comes what uh, you get the contribution from the nonlinearity, which is again, it's a convolution. It involves the, the S itself. And then here memory kernel, which involves again, the S squared with these mod coupling coefficients. Okay, so this is an equation now that one can try to deal with. Of course, it's a complicated equation. It's a linear, it's a nonlinear differential uh, integral equation. Um, but it so happens, and this was, um, yeah, what we got in 2015, is that if you look for scaling solutions, you can actually solve this complicated equation. So you make a scaling ansatz, and you get, you can explicitly solve this equation for all the modes. I don't, uh, okay, now let me tell you what comes out from this explicit solution. I will explain the solution itself, just give you the result. It will depend on the spot coupling coefficients, which couple the fluctuation fields. So the upper index is the mode alpha that you're looking at. And this, the beta here in the bottom, this is the coupling to the other modes that you have around. 
So now let me first imagine I have a situation. And again, these mode coupling coefficients, these compute from the current density relation, right? And the static, uh, this you can compute just from static properties, which you know exactly. So this you get by an exact computation, right? This I want to stress for if you know the steady state exactly. So now imagine that all these guys here are zero. It does not mean that you have a non-interacting system. It just means that I have no interactions to second order. Then it turns out that the exponent of this mode is two and the, the, um, the structure function for this mode is a Gaussian. So this will be diffusion. So if you don't have inter any interaction to second order, uh, you get the diffusive uh, universality class. Um, now let me imagine that the self-coupling is non-zero. So I don't say anything about the G alpha beta beta for beta non-equilibrium alpha, this can be anything. When the self-coupling is non-zero, then no matter what the other uh, elements are, I will get the KBC universality class with exponent three over two, but then there's one difference. Namely, if I have a coupling to, an, to, a, an, to a diffusive mode, then I get something where one doesn't really know what it is. Um, one can call it perhaps modified KPC or whatever one wants. Um, it is unknown. It has this exponent, but the structure function, we do not know how to compute because we don't have any exactly solvable model where this can be calculated. Um, but maybe it is still something like KPC. On, on the level of the mod coupling theory, it looks a bit similar, but it's not exactly the same. Now, finally, let me assume that the self-coupling is zero, but the couplings, the other couplings are non-zero. Then what I get are dynamic exponents, which are of this form. This you can compute explicitly. So it's an infinite series and it ends up with a golden mean and the dynamic structure functions are all um, uh, alpha stable, uh, Levy, or more set stable Levy distributions. So you have again explicit results for the structure function and these are your exponents. Now, if you look at this series that comes out, you will see that these numbers are all uh, Kepler ratios, which are the ratios of neighboring Fibonacci numbers. You can see here, uh, two, the first one is two over one, right? So Fibonacci is one, one, two, three, five, eight, and so on. So this is two over one, this is three over two, five over three, eight over five. So that's what you recognize. This is what comes out. So that means if you have M conservation loss, then your, um, your dynamic exponents will be these uh, ratios of neighboring Fibonacci numbers. That's why we call this universality class generally Fibonacci universality classes. So what you see is that diffusion KPC are just the lowest members of this of this uh, of this general class of universal of uh, dynamic universality classes. Okay, now this is a theoretical prediction that comes from the exact solution of the mode coupling equations, which are, however, an approximation to the non-fluctuating fluctuating dynamics equations, which themselves are, of course, an approximation. So we have to check whether this is not just some artifact coming from these approximations. Okay, but before doing so, I want to know what the claim, I want to tell you what the claim is. So first of all, this theory is very, very general, right? We did not, on the macroscopic level, we do not refer to any microscopic model. All we use are static proper, macroscopic static properties, like the current uh, that you have in the steady state or the compressibility. These are all the quantities that we use. So basically we assume only that microscopically we have some short term interactions, some local conservation laws and therefore associated currents. And also we assume that the slow variables that are relevant for the long-term behavior are simply the long wavelengths for remotes of this conserved quantity. So these are the basic assumptions. And this, of course, this type of assumption can uh, apply to many, many types of systems, right? Uh, uh, okay, now, um, the other thing is we did an expansion to second order only. Now from, uh, this is again an old result, not ours, uh, many known for many, many years that um, quadratic nonlinear terms uh, uh, oop, sub leading. Sorry, it should be. I don't know, hang on. The quadratic ones are leading, right? Cubing terms, they will contribute only marginally. They will be marginally relevant, and quadratic and higher order terms are irrelevant. So, this is a RG result, right? So, that means that this, uh, this quadratic expansion actually makes sense. If you want to include cubic terms, you may get some logarithmic corrections, but let me ignore this. I will take the case where the cubic terms are simply zero. Okay, so. This really means that we are talking about a very broad class of systems here. 
So let me check it. And um, let me first check it uh, for this um, uh, coupled exclusion processes. Well, first of all, if you look at just two conservation laws, then you can predict from the mode coupling theory all possible um, dynamic exponents that can occur. Again, you will have two dynamic exponents, right? For the two conserved quantities. And this was done uh, in parallel by us and also by Herbert and uh, Stolz. Okay, what can happen? Well, you can have various scenarios where both modes are KPZ with exponent three over two that depends on the structure of the mode coupling matrices, right? So um, a star means something non-zero, the other, the red star, something, this means arbitrary, and a red zero means um, definitely a zero. Okay, so if this is structure of the mode coupling matrices, then you get three over two. You see in this case, both uh, um, self-couplings are non-vanishing and so on. So don't want to go through the details. You can have other scenario, one where one mode is three over two, the other one is a five over three Levy mode. Um, you can also have the scenario where one is diffusive and the other one is a three over two Levy mode. You can have the situation where, um, uh, hang on, this is the one where you have the modified KPC. This would be the Levy. And you can also have the case where both modes are the golden mean. So these are the, and you can have also both modes being diffusive when all the matrix elements are zero. Okay, so these are all the possible universal that the theory predicts for two conservation laws. And here are some simulations. Um, so um, we took some lattice gas models and uh, made simulations. Now, if you look at, um, mm, so first of all, here, you know, actually this is at this point just a plot, right? So the green curve is a Gaussian distribution. The blue curve is a KPZ with three over two and the red curve is a Levy with five over three. So first of all, you see that the Gauss and the KPZ three over two are quite similar and you may worry whether or not this can actually be distinguished in any, in any experiment or numerical or real. Well, the answer is yes, you can. I mean, there are these famous experiments by Takeyushi and uh, collaborators where they could differentiate between these two and also simulations, even though this function are numerically quite close, you can distinguish. And the same here, also this difference seems to be close, Levy five over three and Levy golden mean. Um, you can make precise enough simulation to distinguish. Um, no, no, the tails are also different, but um, also this you can see, I will show you a picture later. And then finally, uh, yeah, okay, some other comments, you see the Levy set over three over two is actually quite different from any other. But the point I want to make here is that even when these differences look quite small on this scale, you can see the difference in simulations or in some case, even in real experiments. Okay, now let's look at this now, the real simulation. We take a three lane model. Um, and first of all, um, in the three-lane model, we can change, make parameters such that you expect a golden mean um, Levy mode. Now, okay, what you see here is a, a data collapse. So the yellow curve, this is the theoretical prediction. And here you get rescaled numerical values for different times range from 6,750 up to uh, 15,000. And you see they collapse nicely. Now, let's just take fixed uh, value of 3000, which is uh, 3000, which is relatively small. Um, and then again, um, this is a finer simulation that we done later with more averaging. And what we see here is the following. This is again, um, the numerical value shown together with the theoretical prediction. In this picture, you don't see a difference. So I, let me blow it up. Still no difference at all. See the black points that you made this see here, these are the, um, these are the, no, the simulation data and the green curve is the Levy prediction. So even in not far in the tails, but relatively far away from the center, you get an excellent agreement and in the center inspector being perfect. Okay, so this is for this particular mode. Um, now you get, you can take other parameters where you get other modes. For instance, there is a choice of parameters where you expect 
these um, three universality classes, three over two, which is KPC, five over three Fibonacci, which is in Hamiltonian dynamics, the heat mode. And you also get, expect this eight over five Fibonacci. So here is a picture that shows you all three modes at the same time, uh, uh, simultaneously at various times, how they evolve in time. Now let's look at the new mode that was not known before, this eight over five Fibonacci at uh, t equal to 1000, and let, it, let us fit it with an uh, eight over five Levy. And again, the same picture. If you look at the whole curve, you don't see any difference at all. And even if you zoom in into here, this tail and here, not in the tail, but quite close to it, the agreement is astounding. Okay, so these are old results. So let me uh, give you some more recent results. The first one on the Nagel-Schreckenberg model. The Nagel-Schreckenberg model is a stochastic cellular automaton for vehicular traffic, so really for cars driving on a road. And this is um, a model that has been used a lot indeed for, I mean, a more refined version for real traffic flow simulations on highways. In North Rhine-Westphalia, they, for instance, they've done this for many years and maybe still do it. So what is this model like? Well, again, you have a lattice. Each segment of a lattice corresponds to a certain stretch of road. And um, now you have cars, which are particles, which can do the following. So let me number my cars, give, give them a label N. So a car number n will up, so it's a discrete time uh, uh, process. So in one time step, first you uh, accelerate your car. So your current velocity will be incremented by one unless it has reached the maximum velocity, which you fix, right? Which is, will be different whether you have a Ferrari or a Cinquecento, right? It's uh, not the same for the two. But we look at problems where we have only one type of car. So we fix Vmax and then we accelerate. We also allow for braking. So that means you can reduce the velocity if you realize that the distance to the next car in front of you is too small. So if let's say you have speed five, but you see that the car in front of you has a distance of only three lattice sites, well, then you reduce your speed to three. Uh, actually, well, to one of the, uh, yeah, right, exactly. Then um, here comes, this is all that missed, here comes your random element. If you think of yourself driving a car, um, will you ever drive with exactly a constant speed? No, you will not. Um, you will, if you look at your speedometer, sometimes, oh, sometimes a little bit too fast, I decelerate, sometimes a bit too slow, I accelerate. So there will always be some fluctuations in your behavior. And this is taken into account by a randomization, which in this case is only a deceleration. So you reduce your speed by one unit with the probability P. P is a parameter. You can in, uh, make the model more complicated by also saying that you increase with some other probability, but let's stay with the more simple version. Okay, so these are the changes of velocity in one step. And then finally, you move your car, your car from the current position to the current position plus this speed parameter that you have just updated. So this is how the cars move. And you can, uh, if you go through the rules, you will see there will be no collisions in this model. So this is excluded by the simple model. Let's say it can be used in more refined models. Yeah. Ah, okay. This is the, is a parameter of the model. Uh, yeah. Ah, max, max. Ah, ah, okay. Uh, yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Otherwise, we zero. You're right. Sorry. Yes, this should be max. That's a typo. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Should be v max. Yes. Exactly. Uh, a max here. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. <clears throat> so now, okay, this is a model. It's been a long debate or not. This discrete time um, cell automaton. Uh, it has one conservation law, right? The number of cars, but whether or not this in the, is in the KBC universality class, um, this um, has been disputed because as soon as Vmax is larger than one, you cannot say anything analytically, you can just simulate it. And the simulations are not so easy to make because um, uh, to get good statistics, you have to really have a good simulation. And that's where our student, Johannes Schmidt, came in. He helped us a lot with the simulations. He has a very ingenious way of, of making very efficient simulations. And what we found is the following. For Vmax equal to 2, you get this red curve. And what we put is the pre spoon scaling function. And also for V max equal to three, we put the pre spoon scaling function as a, as a quantity here. And then we fit our simulation data. And you see, again, the agreement is excellent. Uh, there's a data collapse with excellent agreements for many, many times from ranging 1,000 up to 20,500. So clearly this is also in the Cape set universality class, this traffic drop problem. So we may expect this to be true 
field traffic flow, except of course, field traffic flow traffic conditions change uh, over time. So you may not be able to reach the stationary regime. But anyway, there should be, this would be a frame of reference to think of and then see how to fix it and it deviates. Okay, so this is uh, another sign of universality. And of course, all these universal gases have been discovered in the harmonic chain and other uh, simulations and computations. Okay, now let's proceed. There was this funny modified KPZ universality class of which so far um, there has been no, e not even the microscopic model as an example. Now we don't have simulation on this model yet, but but can show that there is a model which has where one expects this universality class to occur. And it's as follows. It's like our two lane exclusion process that I showed in the beginning. So it has the same kind of processes, except that there's no exclusion. So you do allow for this particle to jump here, for instance, right? This can jump here and this can jump there. But the rates otherwise are just the same, except that there's no exclusion. Um, so, okay, you can still compute invariant measure, still product, not Bernoulli product, but uh, there's Poisson on each side. And then your stationary currents are simply this. They're again, almost like the exclusion version. The only difference is that in the exclusion version was a factor one minus rho one here, which is now missing, right? So otherwise the same. But this difference is actually important for the universality classes because it turns out if you take B1 equal to B2, then you get exactly the mode coupling coefficients for this modified class. So this model is a means to, to uh, look at this problem. It hasn't been done yet. It's an open question. But at least we have a microscop microscopic model now where we expect this class to appear. Okay, now another question. This series of Fibonacci exp uh, exponents start with two. 2, 3 over 2, 5 over 3, 8 over 5. But there's another lower ratio of Fibonacci numbers, which is 1 over 1, right? So is there a universality class with dynamic exponent 1? Well, um, we could not find any model with local interactions that has this property. However, um, one can do the following. Uh, one can look at uh, conditioning a process on certain ray events. So let me look at the following process. I have symmetric nearest neighbor jumps. And whenever two particles meet on the same side, they annihilate immediately. Okay, so you jump. When you jump on top another one, these two piles go away instantly. That means if you just look at two processes that in the steady state, the slats will simply be empty. Okay, so nothing will be left. This is trivial. So to get a non-trivial uh, uh, steady state, we also add particles. Then we, we add particles in pairs, but not on the same side because they would go away instantly. We add them on neighboring sides with the rate right mu. So if this happens, again, your maximum occupation number, your maximum occupation number will be one, right? Because um, and indeed, you can figure out that this will be equivalent to a following process, to exclusion process, where you have symmetric jumps with the rate w plus mu, a pair annihilation on neighboring sites now with rate 2w plus mu, and the pair equation that I just mentioned, oh, there should be arrows only, single arrows going here, not going both ways, sorry for another typo, so 0, 0 going to aa with rate mu. Okay, so this is another process. This is a process that will... Mm, uh, approach its stationary state, which is again product um, exponentially in time. So there will be no critical dynamics. However, what you can do is you can condition your process on some atypical jump activity. So you count the number of jumps it will, uh, on, per time unit. It will have some average value, which is given by this W plus mu. But then you can look at realization of your process where the mean number of jumps deviates from the, from the typical mean. So you condition on realizations of this process and um, there is a well-defined procedure for doing so. And then you get effectively a new process for which this condition activity is actually the typical one. And this, this effective process, this has the same transitions at here, but with rates that uh, are long range. So it will be these numbers times a function of complete configuration. So it will be processed with this, with this jumps but the rates will depend, will have a long range dependence on the position of the other particles. Now, it turns out that uh, this is a free fermion system and it will, do, it will remain so after this transformation. And then you can of course solve it exactly with free fermion methods. And you find that for some 
specific uh, jump activity that you condition on, there is a confirmably invariant phase transition line where you can, uh, again, compute everything explicitly. And you find there is a ballistic scaling with exponent dynamic exponent one. And your scaling function will be a Cauchy distribution times one over T. This expresses the fact that you don't have a don't con that there's no conservation law. So this will go to zero, but this is, uh, again, some probability distribution. And here's my observation. One is one over one, which is just this ratio of Fibonacci numbers, and it's less than three over two. It may, be, may have nothing to do with uh, what I did before, because this is, you do not get from mode coupling theory. In mode coupling theory, you a priori assume that Z is larger than one, but nevertheless, it fits, fits into the scheme. Okay, so that brings me to the end. Let me summarize the main results uh, that I presented. Well, we get this Fibonacci family of dynamic universality classes from using nonlinear factoring dynamics and mode coupling theory. So the dynamic exponents are this ratio, this Kepler ratios for enabling Fibonacci numbers. I call them Kepler ratios because it was Kepler who in the 16th century first looked at these numbers when he studied ice flakes, uh, snowflakes. So this is uh, again a quantity that has been studied for a long time. And we know that the limit where alpha goes to infinity is just the golden mean. Um, okay, so here is your sequence of exponents, 1, 2, 3, or 2, 5, or 3, 8, or 5, until you reach the golden mean, which is this 1 plus square root of 5 divided by 2. For all these exponents, we have explicit scaling functions. The Cauchy for this one, and I did not mention that we have another case with that equal one where you get a different scaling. Um, then for z over 2, we get the Gaussian. For 3 over 2, we get three different cases, namely the, the pre over spoon scaling function, then this modified thing, but we don't know what it is. Maybe it's the same after all, and a Levy. And for all alpha larger than three, we get Levy, an alpha stable, uh, a set stable Levy. So one more thing that I did not stress, but which comes out from mode coupling theory, if you have M local conservation laws with local interactions, then you do not arbitrarily choose from these uh, exponents. You can only get a sequence of consecutive uh, exponents starting with two or three over two and going up to, um, there should be an n minus one, so if we, no, no, it's, this can at least be m minus one, the number of conservation laws. So you have at most m different um, exponents, it can be less than m, right? And the lowest one will be three over two or two, depending on your mode coupling matrices. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, we have universality, the sense that we, these exponents have been found in many, many different models, not only lattice gases, but also discrete time strassic cell automata and in these uh, anonymous chains. Okay, now there are many open problems that I think are interesting to study. Um, so first of all, we have this really, for me, fantastic agreement with the similar theoretical scaling function and the simulation data. Now, for the previous spoon scaling function, uh, this just tells us that the simulations are good because we know it's an exact result. So we know how to compute it numerically exactly. So um, this gives information about the simulation. But the fact that we have this excellent agreement also for cases where the, uh, where the Levy has been obtained from mode coupling theory alone, this raised the question, um, given that we know that the simulations are good, whether this, this analytic result from mode coupling theory isn't perhaps even exact. So, well, I don't know how to check this. Maybe there are exactly solvable models where one would expect this kind of exponent and then one perhaps can compute this, this scaling function in some form. Or there are also some rigorous results. And indeed there are some, a few small number of results with a three over two levy where you can see that they actually agree, but only uh, uh, we don't have rigorous results yet for the whole series. So that's an open question. Now, the second question is, what is this modified KPC? Is it the same as KPC or is it really something different? And then um, what happens if you have dynamic exponent less than three over two, particularly set equal to one? Um, will this always be associated with non-local non interactions? Let's say we couldn't find any model with local interaction, which has less than three over two. Maybe it's necessary to have that. I don't know. Um, other open questions that I did not um, talk about at all, um, but let me just mention is, um, we have these Fibonacci exponents, but um, there are two issues. A, given a, given a Z, uh, it doesn't mean that you have covered all possible universality class. There may be different universality class with the same dynamic exponent. It's obvious for three over two, where we already have at least two different ones, maybe even three. And it's even more obvious for set, set equal to one, if you include it, because set equal to one, uh, everything that's conformally invariant will have 
um, will have set equal to one. But then we know that there are many universally classed with, 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 uh, uh, that are conformed invariant, right? So in, in one plus one dimensions, where one dimension would be space, the other would be time. So clearly there will be others and how do we classify this? Are there any underlying symmetries like conformed invariants also for the higher Fibonacci? I don't know. Then another issue are universal finite time effects that may happen. Uh, let me point out that the alpha stable Levy uh, 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 distributions have infinite variance. So, um, but if you do a simulation, uh, everything will have a finite variance initially. Um, so, and when we do our simulation, we actually realize that this finite variance shortly afterwards grows in time with, a, with a, you know, an exponent that is related to the, to the Levy exponent. So this suggests some universal finite time effects. But again, we don't really know what, what this should be like and how general it is. And then again, something completely different. Um, in all of this here, um, I presume, of course, that these mode velocities are real numbers, right? Otherwise, you can't, this will not be a physical problem. Um, and indeed, these mode velocities can be shown to be real under extremely general circumstances, namely whenever your stationary correlations are short range in a very mild sense, then your mode velocities will be, uh, will be real. However, there can be um, stationary uh, correlations that are not short ranged, in particular when you have phase separation, they will not be uh, will not be short ranged, and then the theory doesn't work anymore. Um, and there's work by Mustansi Barma and collaborators where they argue that this phase separation can be described in terms of complex mode velocities. This is something that puzzles me a lot because they do a mean field th theory to get this, but uh, this correspondence I find also interesting to understand. Okay, so these are some old problems. I'm sure there are others, um, but with this, I want to conclude and thank you for your attention. So on the last uh, of your results slides uh, for the non-local interaction that gave rise to the Cauchy, um, although the previous slide actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, you mentioned this conformally invariant phase transition line. Can you explain more on that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so this here, this process, let me discuss in terms of this particular process. This is um, equivalent to um, the XY model. And uh, so the Ising model in a transverse field um, um, and which we know uh, it's, it's really equivalent to a quantum system, right? This quantum XY chain, which is a free Fermi system. So you can uh, make a Jordan Wigner transformation and then a Bogolyu transformation, and you can just diagonalize the Hamiltonian in explicit form. And then what you find is that there is a critical point um, that happens as a function of the parameters. And on this critical point, it's described by a conformal field theory, um, which would correspond to the ground set of your, of your Hamiltonian. And this, uh, uh, so it will have a central charge e uh, equal to one half in this case and be in the easing universality class. And the, the conformal field theory comes from the fact that we are looking at one dimensional space and one dimension time, which makes it two dimensional. Thank you. More questions? Oh, I mean, thank you very much for a nice talk. I mean, so um, I have one, one comment about uh, this uh, KPC peak. I mean, uh, of course, it's true that the true scaling function, you know, goes like for large x goes like e to the minus x cube, and therefore it's very difficult to distinguish from a Gaussian. Right. Now, um, you know, I mean, there are lots of other systems where, where they see this kind of KPC peak. And uh, I mean, usually what you do, I mean, you really make a logarithmic plot of your data. And there you can sort of actually see that, that uh, of course, you know, in the center it will be sort of nice quadratic, but then you sort of see it sort of slightly uh, sort of, uh, I mean, did you try to do a similar kind of precision in, in your models? We did not make this plot um, ah, okay. because um, our point was not so much to study how much it deviates. We looked a little bit and to understand whether there's any kind of universality in these deviations, right? This would be this early time problem, but we did not look. It's indeed one. 
universal or perhaps universal finite time corrections to see how it approaches this, uh, because this is indeed where you would best see it in such a plot, but as I say, we didn't do that. All right, anyone else? Okay, in this case, let's send Gunther again. And uh, we reconvene quarter to 12.